Well, let's try a few of these uh, systems of linear equations problems. When I do, some exercises explained. I tried to pick out ones that I thought were rather interesting and uh, yet made the point of how to do elimination and substitution in, in concert. So let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, I wanted to make a few pieces, give a few pieces of advice to begin with. It's the usual kind of advice I give when we're talking about doing problems. Uh, but in this, I will mention a couple of things that are peculiar to this area of systems of equations. Uh, I use, you'll find as I work through these, that I'm using elimination. But there becomes, there comes a time when elimination breaks down and gets, it becomes easier to do substitution. And the reason is because we're dealing with three equations and three variables and two equations and two variables. Now, if we were doing 50 equations and 50 variables, I would use elimination without a doubt. But in these smaller ones, I sometimes cross over into the substitution uh, category, and you'll see how that works. So I use elimination and substitution. as needed. And I try to be organized about this, but you'll see that I very often end up reducing uh, 3 to 2. To make it short, three equations and three unknowns get reduced to two equations and two unknowns, which of course is an easier problem and can be done usually by substitution without too much work. Some gen generic reminders here. Remember, stay organized when you're working these problems. Organization is just a habit that if you've, if you've been in the course this long, I hope you've developed, but you want to use it here especially. And in these, of course, you want to leave a paper trail, what I've called a paper trail before in this course. And the reason I say that is you need to say what you're doing as you're applying the rules for replacement using elimination or any other operation on a system. You really need to say what you're doing in English on paper as you're doing it so that you'll be able to follow your own notes later as well as uh, other people reading your notes. So let's start out here with a problem that I will pose to you and give you some time to think about this. Here's the example. With a tailwind, that's a wind pushing the plane from behind. A small plane flies 600 miles in three hours. Against the same wind, now acting as a headwind, so it's in the direction opposite the plane, the plane flies the same distance, 600 miles. This time it takes four hours. What I want to do here is find the average. It'll be average due to our formula. Find the average speed of the plane and the average wind speed. Now this will give you, when you put this information down in the form of equations, you will get a system of equations. So why don't you take, <clears throat> take a little time to look at this, and when we come back, I'll show you what I did. Now, in this problem, since it's dealing with speeds and distances and times, you probably want to first start off your solution by recalling the formula distance equals velocity times time or speed times time in our case, okay, because we'll use that. Now here, let's just make some choices. We have the speed of the plane and the speed of the wind. So let's give them different letters. I'll use V here to stand for the speed of the plane. This is part of that paper trail I told you to leave. Write down what you're doing. Speed of the plane, and of course, that'll be in miles per hour. I'll mark that in a moment. W will be the wind speed. Both of these, of course, are in miles per hour. That's the units here. And we are also given the following. The information about the relationship between the distance which is 600 miles either way, and the different velocities and the different times involved. So we have two equations, and I'll try and write the information over here on the left. What we've got is the tailwind equation. Now that's a wind that is going in the same direction as the plane, so it's pushing the plane forward. So we might draw a little picture here where we've got the plane going like this to the right, and the wind is going in the same direction. That's what a tailwind would be. And from that, we're going to get a system of equations here. We get that equation. S equals V times time. The distance is 600 miles either way. 
the velocity of the plane. Now, the velocity is the plane plus the wind's velocity. So that will be V plus W times the amount of time it took the plane to go that distance with the wind, which was three hours. Then the other equation is what you might call a headwind equation. This is where we have the situation of the wind continues to go in the same direction, but say the plane is going in the opposite direction. So they're working against one another. So again, the distance is 600 miles, the S. The V here will be the plane minus the wind. So it's the plane minus the wind times the time, which we were told was four hours going in this bad direction, the direction where the headwind is working against you. Okay, well now I have a system over here that I've written down based on the information I was given. The next thing I want to do is, as I've said before, organize this system into its standard type form. That means I'll put all the variables on the left, for example, and the constants on the right. And then I will begin to go about trying to solve that system. So if I rewrite the system, this is my notation now, as you move from system to system, you can use a single arrow like this, and the brackets to indicate the system. The first one is 3V plus 3W equals 600. The second one is 4V minus 4W equals 600. And we bring back what I had a moment ago, so you'll see, that's what I did. This was 3V plus 3W, 4V minus 4W, and then I changed the order so that the constants were on the right. I will also go ahead and label the two equations as 1 and 2 just so we can keep track of them as we work. The first thing I want to do is looking at these equations I see something that doesn't involve elimination or substitution. I see that I can simplify them by simply dividing through the first one by 3 and the second one by 4. If you see something like this by all means do it. So simplify and that will be multiply is the way I'll put it, 1 by 1 third and 2 by 1 fourth. What we get, and this is something we can do in our heads so we don't need to write it out, dividing the top by 3 we end up with V plus W equals 600, dividing the second one by 4 we have V minus W equals, I'm sorry, in the first one if you divide by 3 you don't have 600 left, you have 200 left. And if you divide by 4, you now have 150. So there I go, slipping up again. Okay, and the equations are now 1 and 2 relabeled. All right, now these are much simpler than before. And how you proceed from here is a matter of taste. What I'm going to do is use my replacement rule and the elimination idea, and I will replace 2, the second equation, by minus 1 plus 2. Because I'm looking at this and saying, if this were a negative V, and I added it to this V, I would get 0, and therefore there would be no V down here. This would be an equation in W. I would know W, and then I could go on. So that's what I'm going to do. Replace 2 by minus 1 plus 2. And as I've shown you before, I'm going to do the calculation for minus 1 plus 2. Just say that that is right here. So minus 1, there's 1 right there. That would be minus V minus W equals minus 200. And 2, which I'm going to add to it, is V minus W equals 150. Now remember, I'm taking the second equation. I am adding it to the first one. I don't subtract because I've already taken care of the negativeness that I wanted by multiplying by minus 1. So I'm adding these two. This first part, again, this is by design. By design, the minus V and the V add to 0. Then what else do I have? I have minus 2W is equal to 150 minus 200 is a minus 50. So if I can squeeze this in at the very bottom, I end up with W equals 25. So now I know W. I have only one variable to get. How do I get it? Well, I take that W and I back substitute into the, any of the previous forms of a, the equations. So I back substitute the W equals 25 into, say, 1 to get V. And you can use any equation that you have. Always pick an easy one. In this case, I get V plus W, which is 25, equals 200. That gives me V equals 175.
Now, in these problems that start out as practical problems, you want to write the conclusion in the language that the problem requires. So what do I have? What are V and W? V and W were letters that I introduced after all. Speed of the plane, speed of the plane is what I've been calling W, so that's 175 miles per hour. And the wind speed, which I called, I'm sorry, I called the first one V. This is W, and that will be 25 miles per hour. So there I have it. I have answered the questions involved, and I'm done with that problem. So I hope you found that interesting, an interesting way of developing a system of equations. Here is another one that I will pose to you and give you some time to look at. This one's a little bit differently. This is sort of a number theory problem. The sum of three numbers is 48. The sum of the two larger of the three numbers is three times the smallest. The sum of the two smaller of the two numbers is six more than the largest. What are the three numbers? Now, this will involve you choosing variables for the three numbers and then writing down these facts and getting, I hope, a system of equations. And once you have that, of course, it's not going to be hard to solve. The setup here is really the most interesting part. So you go ahead and try this, and I'll come back in a moment. Okay, the first thing we need to do, as, as I said, we need to label the numbers. So, let's go ahead and say, let's let X, Y, and Z be the numbers. Now, the statements that were given to us involve talking about the largest two numbers and the smallest two numbers. Well, which is which? We have three numbers here, and if you have any three numbers, you can arrange them in order from largest to smallest. Now, there may be a couple of them that are equal to one another, but you still can write an inequality. So, we can say that those are the numbers, and we can suppose, for the sake of my argument, that x is greater than or equal to y is greater than or equal to z. Now, that is setting them up as largest to smallest. Now, we can address the questions that we were given and write them in the form of a system of equations. So, we'll see that x is the largest, y is middle range, but it is a member of the two largest, and then z is the smallest, and y and z would be the two smallest. So, let me bring the, pa the page back so you can see what we need to write down. The first thing we know is that the sum of the three numbers is 48. So, that would say we have x plus y plus c is equal to 48. That's the first equation. Then, bringing this back, the sum of the two larger numbers, which for me is x and r x and y, is three times the smallest. So that means that x plus y is equal to 3z. Now when we first write these equations down, they may not be in the order we like. We'll reorganize them afterwards. Then the third statement is the sum of the two smaller numbers, which would be y plus z for me, is 6 more than the largest. So that would be y plus c is equal to the largest x plus 6, 6 more. And that's all the information I'm given, and so there's my system of equations. Now I'd like to solve this system. So the first thing I'm going to do is, as I said I would do, I'm going to reorganize it. It's almost correct, but you see that I have a z over here and an x over here that I'd rather move over to the other side. So. I have x plus y plus c is equal to 48. x plus y minus 3z is equal to 0 now. And here I'll move the x over. I'll have minus x plus y plus z is equal to 6. And now I have my three equations, 1, 2, 3 here. And notice I've got my x's lined up, my y's lined up, my z's lined up, and my constants lined up. So now I have to think ahead and decide what strategy I'm going to use. Well, I don't want to try substitution just yet because there's, there are too many equations to deal with. I'm going to go ahead and decide to use the strategy of elimination that says try and get rid of these x's by taking this first equation and multiplying it by an appropriate number, say minus 1, and adding it to the second one would get rid of this x, 
and then just adding the first one without any changes to this one would get rid of the X. So I, that is my plan. Now, it may happen that in the middle of the plan, I find a better way to do something. That's fine, but I need a plan to start. So, starting first, I will replace 2 by minus 1, minus equation 1, that is, plus 2, equation 2. And I'll compute that, minus 1 plus 2. Minus 1, that is, let's see, bring back the previous set of equations here. Let's get them right at the top there. There's 1, and I want to multiply by minus 1, so it'll be minus x minus y minus c equals minus 48. So I have minus x minus y minus c equals minus 48. Then I'm going to add to it 2, and 2 just comes down. So that's x plus y minus 3z equals 0. Now remember what I'm doing. I'm taking and adding this second equation to the first. Okay. Now by design, okay, I'll keep reminding you, this is by design. I have set it up so this will add to 0. That was my strategy. Let's see what else happens. Oh, look, minus y plus y. This I could call a bonus. I didn't expect that, but I got it free, so I got rid of my y's also. My z's then add to minus 4z equals minus 48. My first instinct, of course, is to simplify that. Don't leave it the way it is if you can help it. z then is equal to 12. So now I have z. And if I go back to my system with this new information, here's my system now. 1 has not changed. Y plus x plus y plus z is equal to 48. Now the second equation, which I just finished working on, is z equals 12, which is going to simplify things. And my last equation, minus x plus y plus z is equal to 6. Well, at this stage, I could mechanically go through and use the first equation to get rid of this minus x down here. However, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take advantage of this new information here. And what I will do is substitute the z in for z there, and the z in for z there, and then this z will be a constant, so I'll move it over to the right, and then this z is a constant, so I'll move it over to the right, and I will reduce this to an equation, to a system of equations, two equations in two unknowns, x and y. So I'm taking advantage of the situation here, and that's what you should do also. So let me write down what I just said I would do. I will substitute that z equal 12 into 1 and 3 to get the following. Here is the new system now. It's now a system of two equations in two unknowns. x plus y equals 36 and minus x plus y equals minus 6. This will be my new equations 1 and 2. And you notice the way I'm using these labels for the equations, they only refer to the present set of equations. There's no carryover from the previous ones. So let me bring back the previous page so you see what I did. Here is the system. And if z is 12 here and I move it to this side, I'm subtracting it. So that's where the 36 comes from. If this is 12 and moved over, subtracting it, that's where the minus 6 comes from. And the x's and y's, of course, stay the same. So now I have this new system, two equations and two unknowns, and I feel much more confident in solving this quickly. I can see my strategy here. I'm going to use this equation, x, to get rid of this one. And all I have to do is add the two. So I will replace 2 by 1 plus 2. And you know, this is so easy, I'm not going to do the calculation on the side. I'm going to do it on the fly, as you will. So the original equation, x plus y equals 36, does not change. And now I will imagine adding those two. If I add these, I get nothing here, which is by design. If I add these two, I get 2y. And if I add these two, I get 30. And of course, immediately, even though it's not part of my system, I'm going to immediately simplify this. And I get y is 15. Well, now I'm pretty much done. If z is 12, as it is here, y is 15, then I can take this and substitute back in here. Substitute. And by doing that, I will get x. So let me do that on the next page where I have a little bit more room. And I'll write it out so we have a trail here. Back substitute 
into 1 to get x. And so I will have x plus y, that's x plus 15, is 36. So x is equal to 21. And of course, as usual, now that I've done all of this work, I want to gather all this together and put the solution in one place. So I have that x is equal to 21. And remembering, y is equal to 15. And z is equal to 12. So this would be an example of what's called a consistent system. That is a system which has a solution. In this case, one solution. So I hope you found that enjoyable. It was a little bit more interesting to get started as a number theory problem. Let me now pose to you a third one in this section on exercises. Here is my third problem for you. And this is another one that's interesting, I hope you'll find. And it actually has important analytic geometry repercussions later, but we'll just treat it as a system of equations problem here. All right, here's what I want to do. I want to find real numbers a, b, and c such that the parabola, which is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, the standard form of the parabola, passes through the three points, minus 1, 4, 2, 3, and 0, 1. So I want to find real numbers, find a parabola that passes through these points. Now it ha so happens that through any three points there is a unique parabola. I'll just tell you that. But that will be our job now. Now why don't you go ahead and try that and see if you can make sense of this and where the system of equations will turn up. And I'll be back in a moment. Now, we've got a parabola. Let me write that down. The parabola that we're given, I'll rewrite it here, and I'm going to write it with an f of x instead of a y, but realize that that is the same thing as y, okay? And that will help us a little bit in what we do interpret this. This is ax squared plus bx plus c, and the statement I want to make is that that parabola passes through I want to remind us of what this is, passes through the points minus 1, 4, 2, 3, and 0, 1. So, what does that mean? That means these, and I'll call them xy points, to make my point, if you will, these xy points satisfy, satisfy the equation f of x, which is ax squared plus bx plus c, equals 0. Or uh, satisfies the equation f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay? So those points satisfy this, and they are xy points, which means the x value goes in for the x's here. The y value goes in for the f of x. And what's left? A, B's, and C's. So it looks like we're going to get a series of equations with A, B, and C being the variables. And that's what we're looking for, so that sounds good. So let's write this out. If these satisfy this, then putting this first point, minus 1, 4, I'll even list it over here, minus 1, 4 in here. The 4 is the Y value, so the 4 goes there. The minus 1 then goes wherever the X's are. So this will be A times minus 1 squared plus b times minus 1 plus c. In the second point, that is the point 2, 3, the y value is 3, the x value is 2, so it's a times 2 squared, plus b times 2 plus c. The last point here is 0, 1, so the y value is 1, the x value is a times 0 squared, plus b times 0 plus c. Now that's just a mechanical substitution. Certainly, this is what happens when you start the problem, but we want to reorganize as always. We want to simplify everything and move all the coefficients, or rather all the, they are coefficients for the original parabola, but we're going to think of them as the variables here. We're going to move them over to this side. So as I move from one page to the other, here's what I will do. I will rewrite my system again. And the top system becomes A, minus b plus c equals 4. The middle, the, the top equation, the middle equation becomes 4a plus 2b plus c equals 3. And the last one turns out to be extremely nice. 
c equals 1. Because if you recall what we had on there a moment ago, that these are zeros, right? So c equals 1. Well, I am at the stage that took me a little bit more work in a previous problem to get to. I immediately know what c is. So I'm going to use the same process I used before. I'm going to take advantage of this. So I'm going to take the c, I'll put it in here. And then I will take the c and put it into the other c. Well, once I put it in, those become constants, so I'll move the constant c over to that side and move this constant over to that side. So, writing out what I just said, I will substitute c equals 1 into 1 and 2 to get the following system of two equations in two variables. So my system continues. The top now becomes a minus b equals, the c is 1, moving that over there becomes 3. And a 4a plus 2b equals, the c is 1, moving it over there becomes 2. And immediately I see that I can simplify this one by dividing through by 2. That seems to be the best I can do. So I will simplify because I see it. I write, rewrite my system so I have a minus b equals 3. Then I have 2a, dividing by 2 here, plus b equals 1. And there's my equations 1 and 2, and I'll move on from here. But see, you want to take advantage of everything you see. I took advantage of having c equal 1 to reduce it to two equations in two variables. And I also saw that there was something I could multiply to simplify this, and I did so. Now, with luck, this should now become much easier than it was. Let's see. I will go ahead and maybe get rid of the b, because the, it's already set up for that. If I simply add equation 1 to equation 2, the b's will disappear. So, we write that down. Replace 2 by 1 plus 2. And so, and my new system is a minus b equals 3 is the first one, which does not change. And the second one, let me bring it back so you can remember what it was. A minus B equals 3, we're going to add to the one below. So we'll have 3A here, 0 here by design, and 4 here. So we have 3A, 0 by design in the next case, and 4 here. And of course, I can immediately rewrite this as A equals 4 thirds. Well, now that I have A, I can easily get B. It's just a matter of a little substitution. So I substitute. And if I do that, just keeping track of things here, I have 4 thirds minus b equals 3. That's my substitution. So let's see, if I move the b over there and the 3 over here, I end up with b is equal to 4 thirds minus 3. But 3 can be written as 9 thirds, remember. 9 thirds. And 4 thirds minus 9 thirds is minus 5 thirds. So b is minus 5 thirds. Well, having C originally and now A and B, I can finish the problem and I can make the statement that the parabola that I was interested in, the parabola is f of x equals 4 thirds x squared minus 5 thirds x plus 1. And there it is. That's the parabola I was asked to get. Now, it'll be fun for us if we graph this so we can see that this parabola actually goes through, passes right through all three of those points. So, let's graph this. The window I chose to make this visible is minus 2 to 3 by 0 to 5. And here's how I'll do this. I'll draw my picture over here. The axes were, we've got an axis down here, and one something like that. And I'll try and mark things here so this will be as visible as I possibly can make it. This is minus 1. And here are 1 and 2. I'll need to know where 2 is. And then on this axis, this will be 1, and then 2, 3, 4, and 5. And we know the points, let me go ahead and list them over here, just to recall what they were. The points were minus 1, 4, 0, 1, and 2, 3. 
Now minus 1, 4, if this is 4, we'll put it right there. And 0, 1, we'll put it passing through 1 right here. And 2, 3, there's 2, and here is 3. So it'll pass through there. And if I try and draw this, and you see this on your screen, it'll actually pass through these three points, something like that. And you can check that on your own. This is the graph of that parabola. So it's just a nice way to end the problem. And it's also a nice way to end this particular segment. And we are now going to move on and do a particular application of systems of equations to a topic that will turn out to be useful if you ever take Calculus 2. So we'll go on with that now. Now we're going to look at an application which results in system of equations turning up. It's an application that you probably won't see being used very much. Uh, the first time that you'll probably see it is if you take the second course in calculus and you begin to talk about infinite series, which is a topic that we'll touch on a little bit before this course is over, but won't explore. And it's a nice example of algebra and the use of systems of equations. So here it is in its very long title, an application writing proper rational functions as sums of simpler proper, proper rational functions. And these simpler proper rational functions are usually called partial fractions because they're part of the original proper rational function. Now, it will become clearer as I do it, so don't worry too much at this point. Okay, here's what we're going to look at, this application. And I've shortened the title, as you see, to partial fractions. Recall now. Well, recall something you already know how to do, and then we'll ask the question, how do you undo it? How do you reverse the process? Recall, we know how to add, for example, the following. We know how to add the following. 3 over x plus 4 plus 2 over x minus 3. Now, there's two rational functions or rational fractions, and we know how to add them. We get a common denominator. I'll run through the process here. 3 over x plus 4 multiplied top and bottom by x minus 3. And of course, that won't change anything because that's 1. And we're assuming throughout that the x's are not allowed to be numbers that make the denominator 0, so don't worry about that at this point. And then 2 over x minus 3 times x plus 4 over x plus 4 to get the common denominator. The end result is that we get a fraction with that common denominator, x plus 4 times x minus 3. And on the top, we get 3 times x minus 3 plus 2 times x plus 4. And we finally simplify, multiply out the top. We'll have a 3x here and a 2x, so that'll be 5x, and then a minus 9 and an 8, which will be a minus 1. So we'll have 5x minus 1 on the top. And I'll even multiply out the bottom, which if you check, it will be x squared plus x minus 12. Now notice that this is a proper rational function. Okay, it's proper because, remember what proper means, the degree of the top is less than, strictly less than, the degree of the bottom. Now we know how to do this. If I give you this problem, this is elementary. The question we're going to address here is one that we haven't addressed before. It's how do you go backwards? In other words, here's the picture I've drawn up. How do you do this? How do you start here with the fraction we ended up with, which was proper? How do we go backward to here? These, by the way, are so, fractions that you can call partial fractions because each one is a part of the original. So the big question in this section is how do you do this? Okay, well with that in mind, here is my goal, writing it out. I, my goal is to, to change these into simpler fractions might be called decomposing, so it'll be referred to as decomposition. So to decompose a proper rational function, so we start off with a proper 
rational function okay, into a sum of simpler. We'll have to define what simpler means. Simpler proper rational functions. Now simpler is the key here. What do we mean by simple and why would it be more important to be simple? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to define simpler here. And simpler will mean the following. It'll, it'll be simpler in the sense that the denominators are simpler. Meaning, here's what we mean. Those fractions will be with their bottoms, or if you like the more technical term, denominators. Okay? Their denominators will either be linear powers, okay, linear powers, that is to say, linear factors like x plus 2 to various powers if needed, or irreducible quadratic powers. Irreducible quadratic powers. Now you should remember what irreducible means. Let me do a quick little reminder. Irreducible means that in the quadratic, b squared minus 4ac is less than zero. In other words, the real zeros, there are no real zeros, there are pure complex zeros. Now, why is this simple? Well, it is simple because recall we had a theorem back in unit four that said the most you can factor a polynomial down into is linear powers or irreducible quadratic powers if you want to remain within the real numbers. Of course, you can go all the way to linear powers by the fundamental theorem of algebra if you allow yourself to include complex numbers. Complex numbers, but we're not going to include them. We want to stay with the real numbers. So this is the best you can do. So this is the simplest factorization. Okay, how does this work? Well, let me write it out, start getting the terminology here. This is usually referred to in the literature as partial fraction decomposition. As I said, it would be. Okay. This is the technique we want to learn in this unit, in this section. The technique goes like this. You begin, as I said, with a par proper rational function. So begin with a proper rational function. And we'll be more specific now. We'll write out it as p of x over q of x, where proper means, of course, that the degree of p is strictly less than the degree of q. Okay, so that's what proper means. Now, that we begin with that. Then we suppose that q of x, by some means, okay, has been factored, factored as far as it will go, which means factored into linear powers or irreducible quadratic powers. Okay, so we've got our q factored down as far as it will go. All right, so this is the technique. We begin with a proper rational function like this, p, p over q, and we suppose that the bottom here has been factored as far as it will go. Now, how do we actually construct the decomposition? How can we rewrite this as a sum of simpler proper rational functions? Well, there are two cases. There is the case for every rational, every uh, linear factor, and there's a case for all the irreducible quadratic factors. So. For, we'll do the first one first here, for every linear factor, that's a factor of q of x now, say x minus r to the n, okay, so that is the entire factor there is, that is the, the largest power of x minus r that will divide into q of x. For every linear factor of q of x, then p of x over q of x, the rational function, has a sum and, remember sum and just means a thing that's added, a sum and of the form that looks like this. 
If this is the highest power of n, and we're assuming that here, this is the highest power of n that this x minus r will divide into q of x, the sum n will look like this. a sub 1 over x minus r plus a sub 2 over x minus r squared plus down to a sub n, n and the highest power, that's what the n's are, and then x minus r to the n. This is the sum n, which consists of individual sum n's itself, where, let me tell you what things are here, where all of these a's, a1, a2, up to a n, are real numbers. Okay? Let's examine the form of this here. What have we done? We looked at q of x, which has been factored. We looked at x minus r to the n, the highest power of x minus r that divides into that. And then we automatically wrote down these possible sum n's where we've gone from x minus r to the 1 all the way up to x minus r to the n. And for each power, there is a constant on the top. Now, each of these is proper, constant, and on the bottom, this is a power 1. And although these are not, uh, these are all proper as we go through. And one more thing I might say is that we've got one term here for each power, 1, to n. So you have to have all the possibilities. And why would that be? Well, think about it. If you're going backwards and you want to recombine these into p of x over q of x, what would be the common denominator here? Well, of course, it would be x minus r to the n, which is exactly the factor of q of x. So when you go the other way, all of these could be possible sum n's that add up to your original rational. So this must be added for each linear factor. And you'll see how we do that in practice. Now, this is for linear factors. There are the other kind, and that will mimic this, too. Same kind of thing, except now it's for every irreducible quadratic factor. Irreducible quadratic factor, which has the form ax squared plus bx plus c to the m use a different letter so we don't confuse ourselves. And remember what irreducible means. It means that b squared minus 4ac is less than 0 again, just to remind you. For every irreducible quadratic factor of q of x, comma, the rational expression that we started with, p of x over q of x, has a sum and an object that is added of the form Now, what would this one look like? Well, previously we had constants on the top and linear factors on the bottom. Now we've got a quadratic on the bottom. You might expect that the top, to be proper, could be as large as linear, but no larger. And that's exactly what we have. We will have ones of the form b1x plus c1 over ax squared plus bx plus c plus b2x plus c2 over ax squared plus bx plus c squared, plus all the way up to the last case, which would be b sub m times x plus c sub m, and then ax squared plus bx plus c to the m power. So let me box that in if I can here. And we have the new sum and that will go with every irreducible quadratic factor like this. Again, I'm assuming that m is the highest power of this particular quadratic that divides into q of x, where the same thing for the coefficients, b1 up to bm, m, comma, and c1 up to cm are all real numbers. And again, we have the same idea there is one term for each power, in this case, 1 to m. So this is what you have to include among your sum ends if you have ax squared plus bx plus c irreducible to m, maximal power. Now this looks rather complicated, but it really is not so bad in practice.
I'm now going to do a rather long example to lay out all the possibilities. Decompose into partial fractions the following. x cubed minus 8 over x squared times x minus 1 quantity cubed. Now recognize that this is proper. So we're starting out with degree 3 on the top, degree this is cubed, so that's 3 plus 2 is 5 on the bottom. So it is certainly a proper rational function. And in the solution, you know that Q is already factored. Now, let me be honest, in the problems in this section that you work, most of the time the bottom will be factored, or if you have to factor it, the factorization won't be difficult. But this is Q is already factored, and what we have are linear powers. There are no irreducible quadratics in this case. So we have the linear x squared. We have x minus 1, the linear factor cubed. So that means, based on what we just said, the original x cubed minus 8 over x squared times x minus 1 cubed has to have some ends appropriate for these. Now, x squared goes up to 2, so there should be two sum ends for it. a1 over x plus a, a2 over x squared. Now, that's what we get for the x squared, from 1 up to the power, which is 2. Plus, now we get 3 for the next one, a3x minus 1 plus a4x minus 1 squared plus a5, the last one, x minus 1 cubed. Now that's what we get for the x minus 1 factor. So we now know that this original rational function possibly is the sum of these five simpler partial fractions. Now it's possible that some of these a's are zero, so some of these actually don't appear. But we don't know that yet, so we have to work further to find that out. Now the first thing you do is, in these problems, is always to write this out including when you have quadratics, and you write out the terms involving quadratics. So this is stage one. Step two is always to do the same thing, multiply by Q of X. That is to say, the denominator, multiply both sides by that, because we'd rather not have to deal with rational expressions. We'd rather deal with polynomials. So if I multiply through by Q of X, here's what happens. The left-hand side is still X cubed minus 8. In fact, let me draw a line here so you can visually see this a little better. x cubed minus 8 because the denominator cancels. And then parts of the denominator uh, over here, the q of x, will cancel over here as we go. So let's see what we get. We get a1x times x minus 1 cubed because one of the x's cancels with this x, plus a2. Now this x squared will cancel with the x squared, so we'll have x minus 1 cubed, plus a3 times x squared times x minus 1 squared, because we lose one of the x minus 1's here, and so on, plus a4 x squared x minus 1, plus finally a5 x squared. So that's the first thing you want to do to get a polynomial here. Now we'd like to figure out what all these various a's are. Okay, so find a1 up to a5. Okay, that's what we want to do. Now, how am I going to go about doing that? Well, let me tell you about two different techniques that are useful. You can use both of them if you can, and sometimes only one of them will apply. But you have two options, at least, to consider. Method one for finding these is, I might say it this way, substitute x equal a 0 of a linear factor, which means, remembering what we have here, let me bring back this page, the linear factors of this denominator here are x squared and x minus 1 cubed. So if I'm going to look for the zeros, x equals 0 is a 0, and x equals 1 is another 0. Now those are the only two. But if I use those, watch what happens. Let me take the x equals 0 case, and I will substitute that into this expression that we had a moment ago, which seems to just fit up here. x cubed minus 8 equals all of this. Now notice, when I put the 0 in, everything over here that has a factor of x squared 
or x will be 0. And now on the left-hand side, we will get 0 minus 8. On the right-hand side, we'll get 0 plus a2 times 0 minus 1 cubed plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. Now you see the advantage of doing this. The substitution makes almost everything disappear. Notice there's only one variable left, the a2, and I can solve for that. So I have minus 8 is equal to, what do I have here? Minus 1 cubed is minus, so this is minus a2. So that means that a2 is equal to 8. And lo and behold, I found one of the coefficients, one of the constants. I do this also with x equals 1, okay, substituting up here with x equals 1. The same thing will happen, except now anything that has an x minus 1 term, x minus 1 factor, will be 0. So everything does except the last one. So in this, on the left-hand side, I get 1 minus 8. On the right-hand side, I get 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus a5, because a5 times 1 squared is just a5. So, this is easy, therefore a5 is equal to minus 7. And now I have two of the five constants finished. Unfortunately, these are the only two zeros to look at, and so these are the only two constants I will get that way. So I will have to try the other method to get the rest of the constants. Sometimes it helps in these problems to write down where you are so far. So I'm going to rewrite what I had previously, so we'll have it here. And also I will substitute in for the two co constants that we found, a2 and a5. So a cubed minus 8 is, repeating myself, a1x times x minus 1 cubed plus 8. That's one of the numbers we found, which is times x minus 1 cubed plus a3x squared x minus 1 squared. Continuing here, plus a4x squared times x minus 1 minus 7. This is the other one we found, x squared. The method that I will call method 2, just to distinguish it from the first one, is to say I have a polynomial on the left, I have a polynomial on the right. Like, uh, coefficients of like terms on either side must therefore be equal. So what I will do is to equate coefficients of like terms on either side. Okay, which means, unfortunately, that the right-hand side, I have to be very clear on what all the powers of x are and what the coefficients are, which usually means I have to multiply everything out or expand, if you like. Okay, if I do that, and this may take you a little effort with scratch paper, but I'll try and shorten it here. x cubed is 8 on the left, doesn't change. On the right, let's see, I need to first multiply out x minus 1 cubed. So I have a1x times x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 1. I'll just let you check that on your own. Plus 8, and there's another one of these, x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 1. So I've taken care of these two terms. This one here plus a3x squared times x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus a4 times x cubed minus x squared, running the x squared through, minus 7x squared. Now, of course, that was only step one. I need to go further if I'm going to clean this up. And I'm at the stage now that I can use a little bit of organization x cubed minus 8 equals. If I look at the previous one, I realize the highest power on the right that's possible is x to the fourth. And here's what I always do. I'll start out, write the highest power, x to the fourth, and then I will put all the possible constants that are multiplied by it. In this case, that's a1 plus a3 plus. Now let, let me show you what I just did so you don't lose me here, or I don't lose you. See, I have x times x cubed here. So there's an x to the fourth power times a1. That's one of the two constants. Where else might I gain an x to the fourth? Right here. x squared times x squared is another x to the fourth times the constant a3. There are no other chances for x to the fourth to appear. So that's why I have x to the fourth times a1 plus a3. And then you do that for all of the others. 
So I will have here, I better bring this down below, x cubed times minus 3a1 plus 8 minus 2a3 plus a4, you can check that on your own, plus x squared times 3a1 minus 24 plus a3 minus a4 minus 7, there's a little c c collection I can make of minus 24 and minus 7 in a moment, plus x minus a1 plus 24, plus the constant term, which is minus 8. Now, please note that I went through from x to the fourth to cubed to squared to the first power to the constant. Always do all of them, starting at the top. Do all of them. Now, I will now create a system of equations. You may have wondered why we're doing this in this, in this particular section, in this unit, uh, and this is where the system turns up. I'm equating the coefficients of like terms. On the left, there is no x to the fourth term, which means its coefficient is zero. So that will be zero. In fact, let me do this so we can keep track of things. This is the f x to the fourth equation. Okay? On the left, it's zero. On the right, it's a1 plus a3 because there's the coefficient of x to the fourth. And then I continue this. On the left, for x cubed, coefficient is one. On the right, it's this long thing, minus 3a1 plus 8 minus 2a3 plus a4. Then the x squared is 0 on the left because there is no x squared term. On the right, it's this expression, which is again long, 3a1. Now, minus 24 and minus 7 I will add. That's minus 31 plus a3 minus a4. And then I will go to the x's. And on the left, there are no x's, so again, the coefficient is 0. On the right, it's this, minus a1 plus 24. And then the last one, I'll just put c for constant. The last one, constant on the left is minus 8, and the constant on the right is minus 8. So I can certainly notice that this will be no help. Minus 8 minus 8 is certainly true, but of no use to me. But I do notice this one that minus a1 plus 24 immediately tells me that a1 is 24. So although this is a system with five equations, it turns out to be simplifying itself as we go. The last equation is of no help at all. This one is very easy to solve. And once I have this one, I can take it and substitute it up in the first one, as I see, which then leads to, if a1 is 24, then a3, if I wanted to add to 0, must be minus 24. So now I have a1 and a3. Remember, I previously had two others. I am only now looking for one more, which is a4. So let me pull this to another page to get the last one, a4. I will use, say, the third equation on the previous page, which was, I'll repeat it, 0 equals 3a1, or minus, uh, let's see, the third equation is 3a1 minus 31 plus a3 minus a4, okay? Now, I know a1 and a3. a1 I just figured out and a3 I just figured out. So, 0 is equal to 3 times 24 minus 31 minus 24, that was what a3 was, minus a4. So if I move the a4 over to the left and then combine all of these by hand or with a calculator, I'll get a4 is equal to 17. Finally, okay, finally I have all the coefficients so I can write the solution. x cubed minus 8 over x squared x minus 1 cubed can be written in partial fractions as... 24 over x, you'll have to go back and check that these are right, x, 8 over x squared, plus a minus 24 over x minus 1, plus 17, the a4, over x minus 1 squared, plus a minus 7 over x minus 1 cubed. And of course, these are the, these are the partial fractions, the partial fractions, that the original expression here has been broken down into. So I have now set out what I, I have now done what I set out to do. 
It took a bit of work to get to this stage, as you saw, but if you stay organized, it's just a matter of walking through it. So I wanted to do this long example to set the scene. Let me now do a short example just to deal with the case of the irreducible quadratic. Decompose. And I'll do the irreducible quadratic, as I said. And once I finish this short case, I will pose a problem to you. And you'll have a chance to practice this technique. Here is what I have. x cubed plus x squared over x squared plus 4 quantity squared. Now please note that this is again proper, so we're starting out with a proper rational function. The, degree, the highest degree on the bottom is 4, on top is 3, so we're proper. The solution is the bottom is already factored, and I notice that x squared plus 4 is irreducible. And if you want to check that, the reasoning is b squared minus 4ac equals 0, because there is no b here, 0 minus 4 times 1 times 4, which is c, and that is negative 16, which is less than 0. That makes this irreducible, because it cannot be factored into two linear expressions with only real numbers involved. So since it's irreducible, I can now write out x cubed plus x squared over x squared plus 4 quantity squared must be equal to possibly these sumans, b1x plus c1 over x squared plus 4 to the 1 power plus b2x plus c2 over x squared plus 4 squared. And those are the two possible sumans that go with this q down here. Well, remember what the rule was. First, multiply through by q, the denominator. That will simplify things, so I'll get x cubed plus x squared equals. Over here, I will get b1x plus c1 times x squared plus 4 to the 1 power, because one of these cancels, plus the case uh, b2x plus c2, and there's nothing multiplied by it because the entire expression cancels. And this first part, I'm going to be wanting to use uh, uh, later, so let's go ahead and multiply this out. The b1 times x squared, so that's b1x squared. So I'm multiplying this, I'm sorry, b1x cubed. Okay, and then the b1x times that is going to be plus 4b1x. Then the c1 plus c1x squared, and then times 4 plus 4c1, four plus these two which have not changed, b2x plus C2. And on the next page, I'll reorganize it so that the coefficients are clear. You might have asked the question, now why didn't you try zeros of linear factors? Well, there are no linear factors here, and that's why. So continuing, I now have x cubed plus x squared on the left, and then pulling things together, I have x cubed here times b1, there was only one x cubed term plus x squared times c1, there was only one x squared term, plus x, continuing on downward, 4b1 plus b2, plus the constant, which is 4c1 plus c2. And again, let me remind you what I did here. Here is what I had on the page at the bottom. This was the only cubic, you notice. This is the only square. There were two, this one and this one, that had x's. That's why I got the 4b1 and the b2. And then these were the two constants. And that's the 4c1 plus c2, which I have here. So now I can write my system down. See, as we get through this, this becomes more efficient. I can write down the system. The highest is x cubed. So if I write my first x cubed equation, here I have a 1 on the left. On the right, I have b1. Well, that's nice. Now I know what b1 is on the x squared line on the left I have a 1 on the right I have a c1 again I know c1 so this is turning out to be quite nice I have x on the left there's nothing that's 0 on the right I have all of this 
So that's 4B1 plus B2. And then for the constant, which I label here by C, on the left there is no constant. On the right I have 4C1 plus C2. There is my system, and the reason for this application being in this section. But I have a few things that are immediate. I immediately see what B1 and C1 are. But that's good. And once I know B1, I can put it in here to get B2. So if B1 is 1 and this is 4, that means B2 must be equal to minus 4. And then if I know C1, likewise, I can put the C1 in down here. C1 is 1. This is 4. So also, it is true that C2 is equal to minus 4. Those were the only four, these four coefficients were the only four I needed to get. Since I've got them, I'm now done. So the original rational function x cubed minus x squared over x squared plus 4 squared is equal to x plus 1. That's 1 times x plus 1. That's the b1 and c1 over x squared plus 4 plus, now the b2 and c2 is minus 4x minus 4 over x squared plus 4 quantity squared. And I am now done. These are the partial fractions that I wanted to get this into. So although there is, in this example as in the previous, several things to do, if you always do them in order, you'll be fine. Here is my summary for partial fraction decomposition as I've just shown you. You begin with a proper rational function. Now you have to start there. The top has to have degree less than the bottom. If you're asked to work with a rational function that's not proper, you have to do a division first. But in this section, we'll start with proper. Then you factor the bottom, which is q of x, as far as you can in real numbers. That is to say, down to linear and or irreducible quadratic powers. Now, again, in this section, most of the time, the bottom will already be factored, or the factorization will be quite easy. Then you write out p of x over q of x, your rational function, equal the sum of possible terms based on the descriptions I gave earlier of the sum ends that are possible. Then you want to multiply by q of x, the denominator, to get p of x on the left, equal a sum. And that sum, let me even indicate here, is a polynomial. OK, the sum is a polynomial. Once you have a polynomial equal a polynomial now, then you solve for the coefficients. And there are two standard methods. Substitute in linear zeros if there are any. As you saw, that makes finding certain constants easy. Or, as a last resort, or in any case, something that will always work, equate the coefficients of like terms on either side. So this is the technique that I recommend to you. And here is a problem for you to practice that technique on. I will pose this to you. Find the partial fraction decomposition of 3x minus 5 over x cubed minus 1. And just to remind you, the cubic there, x cubed minus 1 cubed, can be factored this way. x minus 1 into x squared plus x plus 1. So I want you to find the partial fraction decomposition of this. You go ahead and try that. And I'll be back in a few minutes. All right, let's see how this works out. Recall I had x cubed factored for you. Now notice I didn't say that the second factor was an irreducible quadratic. You really ought to check that. And let us check b squared minus 4ac equals 1 minus 4 times 1 times 1. That's minus 3. It's less than 0. So yes, it is irreducible. And so we have this now entirely factored. So the first thing to do is to write down the original expression, which was 3x minus 5 over x cubed minus 1 in its original form prefactorization. And I'll just do that because it's shorter here. Uh, and uh, then the, we will have for the linear factor x, x minus 1, a over x minus 1, plus, and then 
bx plus c for the irreducible quadratic. And you notice I've abandoned the subscripts here because I only have one a, one b, and one c, so there's no point in calling them a1, b1, and c1. So here's what I have. Remember, the next thing to do is to multiply through by the denominator to turn this into a polynomial equal a polynomial. So that will be 3x minus 5 by design on the left. And on the right, remembering the factorization, the x minus 1 will cancel with the x minus 1, so I will have a times x squared plus x plus 1 plus bx plus c times x minus 1 because the other factor cancels here. Now, in this one, I do have a linear factor, so I can try that 0 to look for at least one of the numbers. So if I let x equal 1, which is the 0 of x minus 1, let's see what I get. On the left-hand side, I get 3 minus 5 equals a times 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 0, because that, by design, will be 0. And then I have 3 minus 5 is minus 2 equals... 3a, so that immediately I have a to be minus 2 thirds. So that came up very quickly. Unfortunately, it is the only linear factor, so that's the only one I will get that way. So let me summarize where I am so far. Always good to write this out. So far I have that 3x minus 5 equals minus 2 thirds times x squared plus x plus 1 plus bx plus c times that x minus 1. Now, I know what I want to do next. I want to equate coefficients of like terms on either side. So I need to multiply everything out here and see what I have. So uh, let me do that. Minus 2 thirds x squared minus 2 thirds x minus 2 thirds there. Plus, let's see, the bx will go by multiply by both of those, so that'll be bx squared minus bx, and then the c will go through both of those, and I'll have plus cx minus c, if I can slide that in at the end. Okay, and then rearranging this according to the highest power, which seems to be x squared, I have x squared times minus two-thirds plus b, plus x times minus two-thirds minus b plus c, plus the constant term, which is minus 2 thirds minus c. Okay, now I have everything organized and I can write my system down. The point here is to be organized. Okay, here is my system then. First, I will do the x squared uh, coefficients. There's none on the left, so I have 0 equals. On the right, I have here what? Minus 2 thirds plus b. And then the x coefficients. On the left, I have 3. On the right, I have minus 2 thirds minus b plus c. And then for the c for constant term, on the left, I have minus 5. And on the right, I have minus 2 thirds minus c. Again, although this is a system, it's quite easy to solve. For the first one, we see if this b minus 2 thirds plus b is 0, that can only mean one thing b must be equal to 2 thirds. So there's my b. And then the last one here similarly gives me c. c must be equal to, well, let's see. I solve for this. I will maybe put the c over here and bring the 5 back. So c will then be equal to 5 minus 2 thirds, which you can check on your own, is equal to 13 thirds. And I hope that's what you got. So I have b and c. Previously I got a, which means I'm done. So I can write out the final expression. So 3x minus 5 over x cubed minus 1 equals minus 2 thirds over x minus 1 plus 2 thirds x plus 13 thirds over x squared plus x plus 1. And there it is, the original proper rational function has be, been rewritten in partial fractions. And that's what I set out to do in that problem, and I hope that's what you got also. Now, of course, in the end, if you wanted to simplify further, you could. There's all these one-thirds in here that you might want to pull out front. But the point is, these are now simpler, because the denominators are simpler, than the original, and that was the point. Okay. 
Well, that's the end of this application. We have one more thing to do before we leave this unit, and we'll do that next. Thank you.